Hello there. Haven't posted here in a while. A lot of things have changed. There is currently advent of code in place and uh, a lot of people are solving it. I, I'm solving it too on my uh, Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash uh, You can follow me there. I solve the advent of code problems pretty much every day. But in today's video, I want you to focus on a very specific part of a very specific problem of advent of code. You know, the dynamic programming one everyone's favorite and specifically i want you to explore how you can solve something like that or how you can solve dynamic programming in general in haskell in a purely functional way of course you can always do some you know very quick and easy uh, memorization using maps and stuff like that but can you do that without maps or as a matter of fact without any arrays using only the haskell lists in my opinion yes i think you can um, by exploiting the Haskell laziness. And we're going to look into that in today's video. All right, I'm assuming that you are participating in Advent of Code. You know what is dynamic programming. I don't have to explain what is dynamic programming. You know how to solve uh, simple dynamic programming problems. And you already solved the 10th problem, including part two. If you didn't, close this video, solve it first, because there will be spoilers, essentially. So first, I would like to sort of, you know, recap how would you solve something like that in an imperative way? I'm not going to go through the description. Uh, as I already said, I assume that you already solved this, so you know what this problem is all about. Uh, as you can see, I already solved it too. Here is my answer. And I'm going to just grab the input and actually put it into my folder. Right. right. So again, let's solve it in an imperative way. W what language are we going to use for imperative solution? Um, we could go with C. But to be fair, who programs in that Boomer language in 2020, am I right? Let's actually go with Rust. So uh, let's quickly implement all of that stuff in Rust. So first, we're going to start with uh, defining an entry point. And the next thing we need to do, we need to read the file. As far as I know, Rust actually provides a pretty convenient function to do that. Uh, and that function is called, believe it or not, read to string. Uh, yes, so it's located in stdfs and what it essentially does, it accepts the path of the file that you want to read and returns you a string wrapped in a result, uh, meaning that it can fail. Of course, file might not be, might not be existing, uh, so of course this kind of stuff can fail. So read to string and uh, let's actually create a separate variable for the file path. So it's going to be input txt and let's read the file path okay as we already mentioned it can fail uh, but since we're programming in rust it is okay to unwrap things right <laughs> i mean in that particular case it would be uh, better to use something like expect expect is like unwrap except it accepts a message and lets you you know explain yourself uh, after crashing right so and we're gonna say something like would not read file file path that we were just trying to read so after that here we have a string and uh, in a string, we have a pretty convenient method called lines, which creates an iterator over all of the lines in the string, which is exactly what we need. Next thing we need to do, we need to parse numbers in each individual line, right? So we're going to use function map. Here is the line. And string usually has, well, I mean, usually it has a method called parse that enables you with parsing it into pretty much like any type into which it's parsable. Uh, but parse, if I remember correctly, re also returns the result. Of course, because parsing can fail. If you're trying to parse a number and it is not a number, it's not going to succeed, right? Because it is not a number. So what we'll have to do here, we'll have to unwrap as well. Because, I mean, if it's not a number, there's nothing much we can do about it. We only need to crash. But but again, we, we uh, may take an opportunity to explain our... So God damn it, mate. Uh, maybe I should move my camera down below so you can see shit at least once in a while. <laughs> You see, you see what happens when you don't make videos for too long, you forget how to make videos. So uh, we say that we're going to expect something like that. We're going to say that this is not a number, right? And we're going to provide this, which is, you know, the line. So after that, we have like a, a iterator of over and numbers, right? And what we need to do, we need to collect it into some container. And in this case, in this case, we're going to use a vector as a container. And there you go. That gives us the list of numbers from a file. You see how easy it is to do in Rust? And let's actually try to print that to in ensure that it's exactly what it is. Uh, so, yep. 
So in the first thing I want to do, I want to compile all of that with Rust C compiler and I'm going to just run it and uh, let's see if it's going to work. So it is compiling. It's probably not going to compile first try because it's Rust. Uh, and of course, yes, uh, because I uh, misspelled uh, the variable How about that. There we go. It compiles almost first try, almost first try. But here are the numbers that we managed to read from the input here. Isn't that amazing? My God, it is amazing. So the next step that we need to do is to sort all of the numbers, right? Uh, so yeah, but you cannot sor sort it unless it's mutable. And again, you cannot see all of the numbers here down below, but uh, do you really need to see them? I mean, come on, seriously. So what's interesting, the most interesting part here is the code, I hope. Uh, and my hairstyle, of course. So yeah, there we go. So the, now they are all sorted. But according to the problem, if you know, and you do know because you solved already the problem, okay, if you didn't close the video, there's two implicit elements at the ends of the array. At the beginning of the array, you have implicit zero. And at the end of the array, you have implicit last element plus three. So in that case, after we sorted everything, I want to just insert those elements there. So I'm going to insert zero at the position of zero. Right. And as you can see, I have a zero now. And uh, after that, I want to also push a last element plus three. Right. There we go. And of course, last, by the way, returns option as far as I know, because the vector may not have a last element if it's empty, which doesn't really make sense in this particular situation, because we insert an element into a vector before trying to take the last element. So even if the file didn't contain anything, this operation would never fail just because of that previous line. So if something like that happens, that's a 100% Rust bug, uh, not mine. And that should compile and that should run properly. And now, as you can see, hopefully, hopefully you can see, I forgot how to make videos, uh, 175. So there you go. So on top of that, I don't want to keep access mutable all the time. So let me wrap it into an immutable one. So I'm going to just create something like this. I'm going to wrap all of this stuff into a separate block, into a separate scope, hiding all of that dirtiness from everything everyone else and I'm going to just return access here so access at this particular point is not mutable anymore because we already finished initializing it there we go cool after that we need to start doing DP we need to start filling up the dynamic programming table All right so first let's create this dynamic programming table so it's going to contain i64s of course like I'm using 64-bit numbers because uh, yeah the result is pretty big so it's definitely going to overflow the 32-bit one what DPI stands for it stands for the amount of possible combinations of adapters that end at ith adapter and usually DPI depends on the previous amounts of combinations of adapters and so on and so forth. Our final solution that we'll have to print at an output has to be dp last. But before we can do that, we have to fill dp table up from left to right. All right, so let's try to do that. I'm going to keep extending the dp table as I go. dp0 has to be equal to one, right? So if you don't have any adapters, there's only one way to build that chain and it's just, you know, connect things directly. So to do that, I will have to just push one, right? So after that, I need to start iterating over uh, my axis. Um, I'm going to start from one because I already solved that for zero. Uh, and I'm going to keep doing that until the end of the axis. I'm going to prepare the slot for the current solution. So initially it's going to be zero. And now uh, I need to start iterating backwards until I can connect to a previous adapters. I think the easiest way to do that in Rust would be to iterate uh, from zero to I, right? And uh, in Rust, the ranges usually do not include the last element, which is exactly what we want. And we can just reverse that. We are exploiting the fact that end is not included and that automatically creates a range from I minus one uh, up until zero, which is quite convenient. Maybe there is a better way to do that, but I don't think it matters that much. Here's the thing. Uh, we know for sure, right, that access i is greater than access j because we sorted access. That's uh, one thing that we know for sure. That means we can always quite easily subtract access j from access i. And if that difference is greater than three, that means the jth plug is not connectable anymore and we're going to break out of that loop. If it is still connectable, we're going to just keep adding the previous combinations to the current solution. And after that, the last element of the DP should contain our solution. But again, last may fail, so um, we'll have to unwrap it. 
or I mean, we have to use expect, but if it's, if it's gonna fail, uh, that means it's a Rust bug again, because even if we have uh, nothing in the input, there will be at least two elements, zero and three, and that should have some sort of, some sort of a solution. So this is 100% Rust bug, uh, not mine, again. And let's try to run it and see if it's gonna produce the result. And there you go, look at that, that's the result. Uh, that's the final solution. We did it, we solved it yet again. Cool. So that's how you do that in a very imperative way. Let's explore how to do something like that in Haskell. So first, I want to find a little bit of inspiration from a classical infinite Fibonacci sequence list. You know, the one with uh, zip width and stuff like that. If you've never seen that uh, classical example, here it is. So essentially you create just a list of integers. It's not a function. It's just a, it doesn't accept any arguments. It's just a variable. Well, I mean, do you have variables in Haskell? Maybe not, whatever. So, and how do you define it? You start by defining a list. The first element of the list is zero. The second element, element of the list is one. Basically first two elements of the Fibonacci sequence. And then you do zip width plus and you zip the fibs itself you see this is a variable that is self-recurrent and the tail of the fibs and that's it and that compiles look at that that compile well we need to wait a little bit until it compiles of course because it's haskell or my my uh, laptop is actually quite potato so sometimes you know it needs to warm up some caches and stuff like that i'm, I'm just waiting for uh, for this special splash uh, that will appear when it's done, uh, you know, compiled. There you go, it finally did it! So, and as you can see, it works, and this thing is recursive, and it doesn't seem to be ever stopping. And what's cool is that you can take 10 elements out of that list, and it will give you 10 Fibonacci numbers. You can take, for example, 100 of them, it will give you 100 Fibonacci numbers. And as a matter of fact, it's infinite. You can just, you know, try to do something like that and it will compute things infinitely, indefinitely, right? So until you interrupt them, of course, and probably the encoding right now in the video is quite crappy. I really apologize for that, but it is what it is. So how does it work? The short answer is laziness. We can go into more specifically how it goes, but I'm not sure if I'm going to correct on that. I'm not 100% sure on how exactly a runtime of Haskell works, but I can try to explain how I understand uh, the laziness of Haskell. So essentially, as I already said, it's lazy. That means that if you have an expression that is never touched, never used, it's never going to be calculated, right? So it is gonna be so-called thunk. By thunk, we mean some sort of expression that is not evaluated yet. It's sort of like lazy, unevaluated body. So thunk is a you know terminology of Haskell as far as I know, but I might be wrong on that. I don't know anything about Haskell, I'm sorry. And how would that work? Essentially, at runtime, fibs is gonna be equal to zero, one, and unevaluated body. So until we touched the third element of FIPS, we don't know what it is and it never tries to calculate it. That's why you can compile this program. And if you never touch the FIPS list, it will not try to even do anything. And uh, here we also do tail FIPS. In this particular case, if you try to do tail FIPS, it's gonna be equal to this. So as you can see, tail fibs does not even touch the lazy part. It simply removes the first element that is already known. Doing something like tail fibs doesn't do anything. After that, if you take a look at this expression here, fibs, we know fibs is equal to this uh, thing. So we can just substitute it like that. Tail fibs, we know is equal to that. So we're gonna substitute it like that. And it's quite important to also keep in mind that fibs itself is equal to that. It's equal to itself, it's self-referential. Okay, so what zip width does? If you take a look at just a regular zip, if you have two lists here from one to five and you try to zip them together, it essentially takes the corresponding elements of this list and uh, makes tuples out of them. So zip width, instead of making tuple out of them, it applies a binary operation on them so we can sum up the corresponding elements, basically zip them up. So that's why it's called zip. And because of that, uh, what will happen if you try to zip these two elements? Well, it take the element zero and the element one and sum them up. 
the result of that sum is going to be 1 and this is what it's going to emit and then it's going to remove these elements out of there but look what's going to happen according to this expression this is FIBS, this is FIBS, and this is FIBS. So by evaluating one element with zip width, we essentially added that element to these lists as well, because they are the same. It's a self-referential lazy bodies that basically emerge themselves while you compute them. So, and the next element is going to be like 1 plus 1 is going to be 2. So you add 2 here and then you remove these elements that you already consumed. And then the 2 appeared here, so that means it will appear here. And so on and so forth. This is how this list basically self-referentially builds itself out of just two initial elements. And as you go further and further in the list, you force it to evaluate more and more elements and eventually you will evaluate as many elements as you need. So what's interesting is that in that example specifically is that each element depends only on the previous ones, just like in our example. Can we use the same technique to do dynamic programming in Haskell without any side effects, without any maps, and without any arrays? Just with lists, just like that. And the answer is yes. Let's try to do that. So let's read the input file. So as far as I know, in Haskell, you have a special function called read file, which, you know, just reads file so and you can take uh, input txt and you can read the file after that i think you can split it by lines and you can read each individual line and it's not going to work because read expects you to know the return element but i think there is pretty cool haskell extension called the type annotations i think that's how it's called uh google help type applications okay they're called type applications right applications yeah there we go we enable that and uh after that you should be able to just do it like that at int and there you go so you explicitly tell a read that you want the result to be integer and as you can see it works and after that uh, we should be able to sort this entire array but we cannot because we need to import a special function from data list anyway so uh first thing i want to do i want to enable that uh, extension uh, for the whole file a language type annotations and let's also import data list so we can use all of that uh -huh. there we go so now we have everything sorted okay so uh let me put that into my program so it's gonna be that but again i need to add the implicit elements at the ends of the array so to do that i'm gonna like have a nested do block because it's gonna be a little bit easier to manage here right and then out of that block i'm gonna simply return something like zero plus plus x plus plus uh last axis plus three uh and after that i might as well just print it just to see if it's gonna work or not uh, let's just run it and uh, there we go it worked and you probably cannot see stuff yet again because of my camera yeah there we go it's 175 you can clearly see that okay I'm gonna put it back again yeah professional youtuber by the way now we need to compute DP let's try to apply the same technique we used for uh, computing infinite Fibonacci sequences but for DP right so we're gonna define this thing uh, the first value, dp of 0, has to be equal to 1, right? And each consequent element has to look back. And since we already have the first element computed, let's do a tail of axis, removing the first element of axis because we don't need to compute solution for that one. That's already solved. And let's keep mapping it. Here's what we're doing. We're solving dp for the next element. What's cool in this particular case, we can self-refer to dp here. We need to look back, we need to look at the elements before x in dp and find the ones that can connect to x. All right, so let's actually take both dp and axis. We, we still can refer to them. So we're essentially in Rust, we can look back. We're calculating the current element as i, and then we're looking back. Unfortunately, in Haskell, the lists are single linked, 
So that means we can only look forward, but we cannot look back. And because of that, we'll have to constantly iterate the list from the beginning until the current element. Like in Rust, you're here, you're looking back. But in Haskell, you're here, you're looking from the beginning until you find things that uh, can connect. So it's from the other end. It's a little bit slower than in Rust, but it's gonna end up O of N squared anyway. And the size of N here is uh, 100, so, you know, 100 squared is not that big, it's just 10,000, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's 10,000. I forgot how to do math, I'm sorry. So we're gonna zip these things to, together so we have a pair. I think I'm gonna actually start access first and DP second. So we have pair, the value and the result of the DP, the corresponding result of the DP. And uh, since we're looking from the beginning, we know that some of these elements are already computed. The most important part is not to try to touch the lazy parts, the lazy elements that are not evaluated yet. The first thing we need to do, we need to drop everything that cannot form a plug with us. Right, we're gonna do something like drop while. To detect that we can form a plug with something, we don't really need the value FDP. So that's why I'm gonna ignore it and only care about the uh, the value itself. Right, what does it mean to not be enabled to form a plug? Uh, so that means that uh, the difference between these elements is gonna be greater than three. Right, so because we can only form plugs with a difference one, two, and three, but if it's greater than three, uh, we cannot do that. And that drop elements that we don't care about all right now we need to take all of the elements that we can form a plug with well since we dropped everything that we cannot form the plug with we just need to take all of the elements up until the current one and how can we detect what is the current element well we know that the differences between elements is uh, is always one or three Right, according to the description that you read because you already solved the problem, right? So you know what it's all about. That means we can just take while y is less than x because as soon as it becomes equal to x, that's it. Uh, it's the current element. We did not calculate the DP value for it yet. After that, we have a list of elements, actually pairs, X's and DP's for which we can form a plugs and we just need to calculate the corresponding previous DP's. So to extract DP's, I'll have to take this, only the second elements because as you can see, DP's are a second element here. And I just need to sum everything up. That is it, believe it or not. What's interesting is that we don't need this type application anymore because of this code, the Haskell now can derive the type, so we don't really need that. And after that, print the last element of DP, which is gonna be our solution. And let me quickly format everything. And that should work, that should work. That doesn't really compile for some reason. Is that because of, is that what you want? Yes, that's what it wanted. It couldn't work with dollars here properly. Yeah, it wanted it like, okay, sure, why not? But yeah, well, now we have a DP that calculates itself in terms of itself. So, and let's see if it's gonna work. And it did. So here is the final solution. We can find it. It works and it's fast. It's not using any maps. It's not using any arrays only pure functional lists. How about that? How about that?